ladies and gentlemen, welcome from Channel 4 and from the London studio. In the next 50 minutes or so, uh, my, uh, we will discuss uh, Diamondback CSI Orbital Atterectomy Diamondback System Technology, which is new for the European market. My name is Nicolas van Michem from the Erasmus University Medical Center, and I'm joined by Dr. Miroslav Ferenc from Bad Krozinge in Germany. Both centers in Rotterdam and Bad Krozinge have pioneered this technology for the European continent, but uh, there has been already quite some experience from the United States. In the next 50 minutes, we will discuss this technology, uh, find out what are the indications to use it, and also learn from insights from invasive imaging. We have the experience also uh, from RJ Curtinay from the United States, who was uh, willing to share some uh, of his lectures, and those were pre-recorded. So without further ado, I would suggest to start up the first lecture on the latest insights when to choose orbital atherectomy. Hi, my name is Ajay Kirthne from Columbia University Medical Center. It's a real pleasure to be able to present today in support of EuroPCR, latest insights when to choose orbital atherectomy. Here are my disclosures, largely which result um, in institutional funding from CSI to both Columbia University and the Cardiovascular Research Foundation. In framing this discussion, I want to start with a case that illustrates a problem that we experience more and more in the cath lab nowadays, the underexpanded stent. This was a patient who had a stent placed in her LAD and despite this could not get adequate expansion, came back, had rotational atherectomy to try to ablate the stent, came back again, and this was the case that we were confronted with. You can see a very underexpanded stent in the proximal LAD. Um, this would not could not be crossed by an intravascular imaging catheter. This also could not be crossed by a conventional balloon and finally required a 125 balloon with serial inflations bigger and bigger to try to get this to expand. Ultimately, even non-compliant balloons could not expand this at 30 atmospheres. Two different companies could not expand this and this needed to be treated with laser atherectomy with contrast, which then resulted in a good uh, result for the patient. The question is, is how or why did this happen and does this happen frequently? Are we seeing more and more of this? And I would say the answer to that, un unfortunately, yes. We know that our stents today are far more deliverable than they used to be, and we often can get stents to lesions, but then they fail to expand. In some respects, that's even worse for the patient than not having gotten the stent there at all. So the key here for calcified lesions is lesion preparation, and that consists of both plaque modification as well as expansion of the lumen. I think most trainees and most interventionalists understand and recognize that calcification can prevent you from getting a stent to where you want it to go to. But it's not just about getting your stent there, it's about really getting this to expand and modifying the plaque adequately so that that can actually occur. You will therefore minimize trauma with severe dissections by uncontrolled inflations and also create a larger middle lumen diameter. The reason it's important to prepare lesions adequately when the vessels are severely calcified are shown here in this picture. You can see that there can be abrasion of the stent, there can be abrasion of the stent polymer, you can get under expansion. In some cases, the stent might come out if you really are struggling so much and the stent gets stripped. So all of these things make life very difficult in the cath lab. And the real question is why do we have to suffer that way? Couldn't we just prepare the lesions adequately and then implant our stents? What's known though is even if we prepare the stents, uh, the lesions adequately to get our stents to where they get, we might not be able to fully expand our stents. And the reason we might not be able to do that is because we're trying to expand the stent within a concrete tube. If it's flexible or in air, that stent may expand more and more as you inflate balloons. But the more concentric it is, the more hard it is, the thicker the calcium is, the harder it is for the stent to expand. And that's been shown in study after study. And unfortunately, if you don't expand your stent, that's associated with worse outcomes over the follow-up period. We know that there are many ways to potentially treat coronary calcification. They include NC balloons, they include um, lasers, they include specialty balloons, atherectomy, lithotripsy. And the real question is, what are we trying to achieve in order to get our stent to where we need to get it to and to expand appropriately? Of late, the insights that we've been afforded with intravascular imaging have illustrated that really what we're trying to do is we're trying to break the calcium, to fracture the calcium so that our stent can ultimately expand. 
if, for instance, the calcium is only on one side of the vessel, we know our stent will expand because it'll expand on both sides. But if we can crack calcium, particularly if it's concentric or even if it's eccentric, we know that by breaking that plane, you will get better expansion of the stent as a whole. And this is as shown here in the bottom of the slide. Once you get a fracture, you get a larger um, minimal stent area at that point in time. We and others have looked at scores to identify this. This is an OCT-based score, basically showing that the more angle of calcium, the longer length of calcium, and the thicker the calcium, the more likely you are to require an atherectomy-based approach or another type of approach to be able to fracture that calcium and then get the stent expansion that you need. So the focus of this talk today is to talk about the Diamondback 360 orbital atherectomy system. And what is this system? Well, it's indicated for severe calcification. It's a quick setup. It's electronically controlled. It has a uh, controller that comes in on a pole. There's no gas tanks or anything like that. And it allows us to perform atherectomy, not only of superficial calcium, but also potentially deep calcium wall fracture with a single device. Now, this is advanced over a wire called the Viper Advanced Wire with a flex tip. The reality is this is not the wire that I learned with this device. The initial Viper wire was a very stiff wire and it was supportive, but it was prone to wire bias and was somewhat difficult to wire. This wire, the new wire, the flex tip wire, actually works like a workhorse wire, much more flexible, so there's less wire bias. And for me, we wholesale adopted the use of this wire after um, once it came out after our experience with it. The way that OAS works is this differential sanding, similar to what would happen with a rotoblader, but without front cutting tip. And so what's interesting about this device is there is a nose and this nose doesn't have um, blades on it or doesn't have diamonds on it. So when that actually goes forward, it goes through the lesion via spinning. And then in the tight lesion, you see sanding that occurs in a differential platform. So you'll get abrasion and uh, debulking of the calcium that's there. But what's interesting is because this device orbits, there's two attributes that, that are sort of leveraged to its advantage. The first is that the device can get across the vessel, not only in the area where it's, it's lodged with wire bias. And the second is because it sort of has forces back and forth, there is a potential to crack deeper calcium. And you can see that this uh, has, it's turning in its orbit, but it's also going across this vessel at the same time. So essentially what you get is this bidirectional sanding because there's no front burr, you can actually do it in both directions. It's a one, two, five device, so it actually takes up less room in the lumen as a whole. And the flush rate is also high, so it maintains adequate flow through the vessel at that time. And you get these pulsatile forces against deep calcium. So in a sense, if you look at a schematic of how this device works, what you essentially get is differential sanding, yes, and you get these forces that can affect deep wall cracking as shown here in in the, uh, the uh, OCT. Now, a unique other attribute of this device is in the case of a, something like a calcified nodule, you can effectively get good atherectomy. And we know that calcified nodules are being recognized more and more now as something that we see on angiography and are associated with bad outcomes. This is just an example of this showing that the prevalence of calcified nodules is far more than we would have otherwise thought largely based upon not only angiography, but also intravascular imaging too. Now, as far as the ability to modify deep calcium, this is a great OCT image of what you see. And this was an article that was published, we published um, showing this. And even with eccentric calcium that's deep, because this orbits and it can go in this direction, you will get fracture and you will get um, uh, ablation of calcium that can be even eccentric in this way, which is somewhat unique about this particular technology. Now, what about the data with regards to it? Orbit 2 was the study that led to approval of this device here in the United States. It was a single arm registry. And in the trial, procedural success was quite high. Um, the most frequent events that occurred were the CKMB elevations, three times the upper limit of normal. Um, but these were by and large lesions suited for atherectomy, so severely stenotic lesions with small MLDs that then led to this. And it's no surprise that there were these CK elevations that were seen afterward. Now, one of the things that's been brought up about this technology is the rate initially of perforation, slow flow, because it's an atherectomy device. But I would posit that in the Orbit 2 study, this was before the use of this newer flexible wire. For those of you that are used to using Rotoblader, you know the difference between extra support and the floppy wire. It's the reason why in our practice with Rotoblader, I've gone completely to the floppy wire. And this was early on in the experience of the specific device. I'll show you some more data later demonstrating um, what can happen in the real world and what you would expect these rates to be. Because of the fact that this is a single arm registry, 
Um, CSI, um, in collaboration with the Cardiovascular Research Foundation, I'm fortunate to be the PI of this study, has conducted and has, has launched a 2,000 patient randomized trial to determine if an OAS first strategy is superior to a conventional balloon based strategy alone. It's so important in this space to do true head to head randomized trials rather than comparing non randomized data from one study to another because we know that the lesions and the patients that are in each of those non randomized subsets may vary across those subsets. Sets. And so with Eclipse, which is now over three quarters enrolled, we hope to be able to get this answer. But what are other ways to potentially lower the rate of adverse events? And I think this is an illustrative example of why I think it's hard to cross compare across published series. And so this is an example of a case um, that, that was done at an outside institution where you see this severely angulated and tortuous osteocircumflex. And the question is, would you atherectomize this lesion? And I think anybody that understands what atherectomy is in fact, that's a burr going through a lesion spinning at high speed. Whether you've done it or not would tell you that this does not seem like a good idea, especially because the way the wire is here, you have severe wire bias and this even with differential sanding will cut across this vessel. And that's exactly what happened in this case. In this case, what, what occurred is there was a perforation at the ostium of the circumflex. This was successfully sealed with a coverage tent and the patient did well. But to come back to the fundamental question, would you atherectomize this lesion? The answer would be no. And so my feeling is that with refined practice over time and understanding that there are specific tools that are good for certain things and not good for others, we can do better. And so this is just an example of this, the Mount Sinai Miami Observational Registry, in which the rate of perforation was exceedingly low, was under 1%. Stent delivery was highly successful, and there are low rates of complications in real-world practice. So I'll show you a case to tell you how I use orbital atherectomy. This is just an example of a case. Because the device is small, low profile, I was able to do it six French via or a radial snuff box access. And what you see here is a calcified left main, a calcified obtuse marginal as well. So how are we going to treat both of these? Well, this we might just treat with balloon normal and this we might atherectomize, but it's so big that conventionally you might need a very large device. OAS was actually perfect for this device. Um, I will just show you that this graph to the lower pole was open, but it did not supply this territory. So what we ended up doing here is we said, let's cross with the wire and see what the intravascular imaging showed. Severe concentric calcification. The IVUS would not even cross into that obtuse marginal branch. So what we then did is I said, okay, well, let me get a microcatheter across. I'll exchange and balloon this. But unfortunately, even a microcatheter would not cross this. Now, perhaps that's because of proximal stenosis, and perhaps it's because of the support of the six French system. But nonetheless, even with spinning technique, this would not cross. So what I did is I wedged the microcatheter here and advanced the Viper wire flex tip through this tortuosity because it's that good at being able to man manage it. Once that occurred, we then said, okay, we're going to plan doing low and high speed here. We're going to do low speed here because the device comes in two speeds. And in fact, to advance it through this area, you can use a feature called Glide Assist where it only rotates at 5,000 RPM, so you don't even ablate, but yet it defeats the friction that would happen in that segment. And that's exactly what we did. So basically high, low, and high here, glide assist through here, and low at that segment there. After doing atherectomy, this is the picture that was taken, um, demonstrating there's uh, some debulking here. And then after that, balloons cross without any difficulty, and this becomes conventional PCI, but good technique PCI, where you're optimizing your stents, you're doing it imaging-based. And so this was NC balloon dilatation, further NC balloon dilatation here. You can see the balloons expand very nicely. That's a very important step to be sure that you can expand and you can crack before you uh, put your stent in. And after angioplasty alone, we then did imaging and then implanted a stent in the circumflex here in the mid with a provisional approach to the side branch, then employed a bigger DES to the left main. And this was all done with a single 1.25 device. So you didn't have to use multiple, multiple devices, all done six French radial and did final imaging showing adequate expansion and good lumen areas uh, after the stent was done. Here's what the final angiogram uh, showed. So ideally situated for this type of case with a single device. So what I would conclude with in this sort of whirlwind of, of both fundamental premises, data, and then an actual case is that we know that coronary calcium is becoming more and more prevalent in the modern day cath lab or the chip era. This is because of an aging population, downstream presentations, more comorbidities. And we also know that calcified lesions are among the highest risk lesions we treat, not only in the cath lab, but also in terms of longer term outcomes as well. So 
what we feel is you need to image, you need to figure out exactly what you're dealing with, diagnose the calcium, and then use the device that is most ideally suited to the specific lumen morphology that you see, the lesion morphology you see. For many reasons, I think that OAS has a large role there because you can modify surface calcium, you can crack deep calcium, you can use it in smaller vessels, and you can use it in larger vessels, all with a single device available in six French, um, uh, and even potentially, if you need to, through a guide extension. I will also say that the field of adjunctive technologies for calcific lesions is heating up. There's more and more data that's emerging soon. As I mentioned, the large-scale eclipse trial is nearing completion of enrollment, and from studies like that and others, we really look to inform our practice to be able to help our patients in the best way possible. Thanks so much for your attention. Ajay, that's an excellent presentation there. Uh, utilizing the device at uh, slow speed with single device, we're able to debulk and deploy the stents very appropriately, even in larger vessels. Obviously, we want to use the device at least in more than 2.5 millimeter vessel. Great technique, uh, great technique. And uh, thank you again for a wonderful presentation. So, so Dr. Avula, this is Nicolas uh, from Rotterdam. Um, so thank you very much for joining us. Um, you have, of course, uh, arguably most experience with this technology um, as the United States has been uh, exposed to this technology for quite some years now. Um, uh, RJ clearly um, referenced to the importance of diagnosing the calcium, the importance of invasive imaging. Is this also part of your practice that you would first address the calcium with some kind of imaging in order to determine your, your strategy? Uh, absolutely. As all of us know, calcium is everywhere, ubiquitous, especially in, as uh, Ajay pointed out at the end of his presentation also, older patients, dialysis, hypertensive, diabetic, vascular patients, smokers. So what I do generally is I will take at least one um, quick cine shot on the coronaries there so I can document the calcium first. That's where I start first there. Then obviously I'm a big user of uh, intracoronary imaging, both OCT and the IOS. And I will document what the calcium arc and the depth of the calcium based upon the OCT measurements. And we will see at least 180 degree calcium arc. And that's when we can do almost in an ad hoc way, when I decide there's a severe calcification, severe stenosis, then we can decide uh, with the device and then we'll proceed accordingly. And essentially all my atherectomies I do, I do them with intracoronary imaging. You know, that that's a, almost essentially a standard thing for me. Yeah. Okay, so um, Miroslav, now uh, talking to uh, from a practical point of view, is this a complex procedure, this orbital atherectomy? Because, you know, you have this Viper wire and then you have the 125 device, but do you need like supportive guiding catheters? Um, Miroslav, what is your opinion on that? Yeah, uh, thank you for the invitation. And um, we use it now from February, uh, this system su successfully in our cabinet. And now we have an experience of around 60 cases. Um, and what is very suitable, very positive for this system is uh, you can use it ad hoc, uh, even if you have six French radial uh, axis. So this is, I think, very important. We still will be able to achieve a channel uh, of around two millimeters, and um, this is uh, what we what we really like. So you just going with coronary range, you see very calcified segment. You can go um, uh, as suggested and, and recommended with imaging. We do imaging, but not in every case. Uh, we usually see by angio um, um, specific calcifications, and then we. Uh, believe okay to to go with um, uh, primary debulking strategy is better, or you go with a balloon and ba balloon doesn't expand. So then it's very clear you have to use some debulking device. And for this reason, for this setting, um, is uh, orbital atherectomy an excellent um, device to to go ahead. So we 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 would recommend. Yeah, a brief comment on this uh, on this fiber wire also, uh, Miroslav. Is this is this uh, different from the stainless steel wire that we use yeah. for rotational atherectomy? 
this is a really good point. Um, I personally um, see a benefit uh, for crossing. The, the wires really has has really good uh, crossing profile, especially if you have tortuous vessels. So you could go really good ahead. Um, from my perspective, um, if you have to stand some longer segments, maybe with some tortuosity, I think it's really better to exchange this wire to extra support uh, standard wire. So this is my personal recommendation to younger yeah. doctors. Uh, Doctor, but the wire is really very good and, and cross sometimes unbelievable uh, difficult anatomies, uh, which will be never a very difficult uh, crossable with uh, Rota Pro wire, for, for example. Yeah, I, I agree. It's a very attractive wire uh, for even com complex lesions, for wiring complex lesions. Dr. Ravula, what is your experience? Do you only use the Viper wire and then finish your case up to the stents? Or do you exchange for another wire after you did your spinning and sanding? Yeah, both actually. A lot of times I try to, obviously what I do is, uh, the one thing though, because of the intracoronary imaging, I generally use a standard, you know, PCI wire uh, to get my imaging catheter so that I do not damage the wiper wire because uh, you know, of the device utilization. Then once I do this, I generally do side-by-side -side wires with the wiper wire and take out the standard PCI wire, which generally tends to be BMW most of the times, or even choice PT. Then I carry out, and many times, you know, uh, I can essentially use the wiper wire to carry out the intervention, including the stent and the post dilatations, and uh, go on further there. Unless I had a lot of difficulty, then obviously I can use the same wire I used before for the imaging catheter to use it as a body wire and take care of the intervention. But I try to finish the intervention on the wiper wire as much as possible. Yeah. How does this technology behave in these uh, uh, tight, very tight calcified lesions? Is it difficult to? to treat these with orbital atherectomy? Uh, not, uh, not really. I think once you get used to the device, I think it becomes very user-friendly. As uh, Dr. Ketane pointed out also there, I use the glide assist uh, mode very uh, uh, frequently so that I can get up to the lesion without much of a hassle. And then from the lesion onwards, with gently as you know, one to three millimeters per second advancement of the lesion, almost like slow pecking way there, not to be in a rush at all, um, and do that. And I think you know it's very user friendly. Actually, in fact, it is not technically that difficult at all to use the device. Mm -hmm. And also, a lot of times uh, I do retrograde approach, meaning I cross the lesion even with the glide assist and come backwards again, especially if there is some tortuosity, then so that I can minimize that wire bias also there. Yeah, I think this is an important uh, differentiator that you you provide bidirectional treatment, right? It's not only forward, but also going backward that you will uh, send or spin uh, in the lesion. So that that is, uh, I think, also different from the existing technology so far. Absolutely. there. So you, know, you got a bidirectional ability to do it. And also you got this orbital motion that can really... Uh, as it has been shown in our uh, own in a retrospective study, at least you know the last 20 people we did the atherectomy, we did the imaging before and after. We can see the sanding plus the fractures in the plaque, both superficial and deep. Literally in all the people at 80,000 RPM, meaning the low speed, one to three millimeter per second uh, at three runs. Actually, we have documented that. Yeah, and this is the perfect bridge to the, the next lecture that also is by uh, RJ Curtinay, and that will provide insights from intravascular imaging with orbital atherectomy. So, greetings from Chicago. Uh, today in the Euro PCR 2021, I would like to discuss the imaging and the treating of severely calcified vessels with uh, specialty devices such as Diamondback 360 coronary orbital atherectomy systems there. My name is uh, Dr. Surendra Agula. I'm one of the interventional cardiologists. As all of us uh, interventional cardiologists are very familiar with the calcium and its implications for our coronary interventions, meaning on the negative way, as the calcium clearly inhibits the percutaneous intervention optimization 
by inhibiting the stent expansion there. It can cause multiple problems, such as dissections, and we are not able to dilate the coronaries and the stents do not expand, and the patient presents back again rather soon with multiple cardiac problems, especially related to the stent failure. As all of us know again also, the, sometimes the dissections can occur distal to the deployed stent where it will be extremely difficult for us to position our stents beyond these areas. And the calcium precludes the expansion of the stent as it was known before, significant calcium can occur almost in about one third of the patient population, especially in renal failure, diabetes, advanced age, and other comorbidities. Recently, the thought process has also evolved that with under expansion, the drug distribution from the drug eluting stents may be suboptimal also. It has been shown over and over again in multiple studies, including this registry from almost more than 19,000 people published uh, about you know, a few months ago, has shown even in the second generation drug eluting stent um, issues also, the stent optimization and the future cardiovascular events, which they describe as patient-oriented composite endpoints is still about 27% over a five-year period, approximately about 5% or so per year, as it was known before. And obviously, this is more common and more prevalent in uh, moderate to severe coronary calcification when compared to either minimal or no coronary calcification. So the burden and the onus is on us to optimize the stent placement and the better outcomes. Again, it has been shown in the uh, studies by Dr. Song from the optical coherence tomography, especially when the square area resulting in under expansion of the stent, which was defined as four millimeters square, the stent failure is clearly much more frequent secondary to under expansion. Whereas over beyond one year, the stent failure is related to neointimal hyperplasia. Again, this has been shown in multiple studies. So the culprit at the end of the day turns out to be the under expansion of the stent where it becomes a nidus or a focal point for future cardiovascular events or major adverse cardiovascular events. Now let me turn on to the next page regarding some case examples which we have done with the optical coherence tomography where we can visualize the plaque characteristic much better and we can expand our stents, especially with the assistance of optical coherence tomography with orbital atherectomy. We can ablate the calcium better. We can create um, much stress on the vessel wall in a way where we describe sometimes as the so-called Mullins effect, whereby stressing the wall with this orbital motion, we can actually make the vessel wall uh, almost you know, much more expandable to use it for our advantage for stent expansion. Now, we are going to discuss some case examples where the optical coherence tomography contribution to the excellent outcomes for orbital atherectomy for better stent deployment and I will show you some excellent cases. They are trying to convince you the intracoronary imaging, such as optical coronary tomography, with orbital atherectomy will be a great management tool and strategy. Case number one, a 66 year old physician, reasonably active with family history of coronary disease presents with chest discomfort for which he underwent a CT angiography initially revealed a heavily calcified vessel in the proximal LAD, as you can see. And we utilized a standard six French guiding system via radial route with a workhorse wire, we we're able to carry out the optical coronary tomography and subsequently the orbital atherectomy was done 
with the night null flex tip wire with three runs at 80,000 RPM, which is defined as the low speed. We usually run these cases at 80,000 RPM between 20 to 25 seconds each run that has been our standard protocol. And we'll size the stenting and the balloons based upon the optical chorus tomography. We do the optical chorus tomography pre-orbital atherectomy and post-orbital atherectomy. In these cases, what I would like to show it to you is the extent of the calcification that can be seen, as you can see this area with calcific nodules, and also the clearly defined calcification that has been shown. And you can see this is all the calci calcification as defined here with this thin line being the intimal area. And clearly you can see that where my arrow is with the calcification and the orbital atherectomy was done. And the post orbital atherectomy imaging has shown clearly, you can see the classic concavity that you achieve with the orbital atherectomy. As you can see here, along with the fractures. And you can see this classic, even in a magnified view, this is the true lumen of the vessel and we're able to achieve an excellent results with these fractures that you can see here also. And appropriately sized and it looks excellent. We'll move to the second case, which is also an LAD, calcified vessel, diabetic patient with history of mild LV dysfunction and positive stress test with EKG changes, underwent coronary angiography. As you can see, the proximal LAD had significant stenosis. And the orbital atherectomy wise, you can see this is the clearly defined area inside, that's the calcification. And the orbital atherectomy was done with excellent results. As you can see, there is clearly, this is the concavity I was talking about and the intimal sanding that you can see off and again, this is the classic concavity that you see and the intimal sanding with the thin intima was there. And you can see this is all this with clearly defined borders is the calcium. With early calcific nodules also you can see on the around 11 o'clock. And again, post tenting the appropriately sized based upon the OCT, excellent results. And this is the standard equipment that we used. And going to the next case again, you can see in the middle lady, there is the significant lesion here. 76 year old female presented with chest discomfort and STT changes. And you can see in the longitudinal view of the optical coronary tomography also, you can see the lesions with calcification as clearly defined as you can see between 11 and 12 o'clock there. This is the post OAS run. And again, you know, I would like to draw your attention to this. These classic minor cuts that you can see and also the classic OAS cuts that you have seen, which I will show you to you again here on a still view of the same patient. This is the classic OAS cut, and you can see these fractures. You can multiple cuts, actually, in fact. And this is all the calcified, which is clearly, you know, you can see outside there. And again, between uh, 2 o'clock to around 12 o'clock, you can see the classic concavity. Interestingly, sometimes you can see these micro thrombi also, which are generally taken care of with the stenting. And you can see these small micro fractures you can see here and also here, and with excellent results in the stenting with the LAD with the standard equipment again. What has been uh, in our lab, what we have been doing is, we are standardly using 80,000 RPM op optical, with, I mean, with orbital atherectomy, with optical coronary tomography, pre and post orbital atherectomy. A lot of times we do post stenting also, but generally speaking, that's not 100%. 
However, our optical coherence tomography is 100% pre and post orbital arthrectomy. And we assess the lesions. Generally, we do have a three runs that has been our standard. Even at the three run, 80,000 RPM, which is so-called low speed, clearly demonstrates to us sanding of the intimal layer along with multiple fractures, along with many times the classic concavity that we expect to see with the CSI orbital arthrectomy, thereby having excellent stent expansion. To be honest, we really did not have any problems at all with the stent expansion when we see these fractures um, in multiple views there, which are able to define and delineate. And we had excellent results. And I sincerely believe intracoronary imaging is an integral and very essential part of this orbital arthrectomy uh, so that we can have excellent results, especially in patients with a severe calcification, as I have been showing it to you in those pictures, at least about 180 degree angle of calcium and the calcific nodules, and uh, at least probably about half a millimeter thickness of the calcium that we see. Because in many studies has shown that the calcium thickness of about 180 degree angle along with 0.5 millimeter thickness of calcium really is the difficult part to treat without these atherectomy devices where this orbital atherectomy by its dual mechanism of action, meaning intimal sanding along with the pulsatile forces, which we in metallurgical terms, they describe it as Mullen's effect, meaning stress on the blood vessel will yield and causes less strength in the blood vessel intimal wise so we can expand our stents uh, to the best we can to the optimal results will be achieved. Thank you for your attention. That was very nice, Dr. Avula. Uh, maybe a first question. You already addressed it that in the majority of cases you will use the ATK RPM, the slow speed. When, when would you convert to the, to the high speed, to the 120K? What uh, would be an indication? Rarely ever, to be honest with you, rarely ever. Um, because that will be dictated to some extent by obviously the caliber of the vessel, at least it's close to four millimeters or so. But I won't even look at the vessel size that way. If I do an optical coherence tomography, if I had enough fractures there, then obviously in, in a four millimeter vessel, then I'm done and then I'm going to stent it. You know, 3.5 3 to four millimeter vessel, if I do a three run OCT, after three runs, I do the OCT, and I did not see major fractures, and I'm not you know, convinced that the vessel may yield, mm -hmm. then I might consider 120,000 RPM. But I will be fair, rarely ever. I, I, I think it has been probably a few years since I have to go to 120,000 RPM. I stuck with 80,000 RPM, slow speed, one to three millimeters per second, both anti-grade forward, retrograde backwards, and slow methodical uh, utilization and there is some learning curve to it. One of the chat, the question came about was also, what is the learning curve? The learning curve is not really that difficult. It's just about, you know, two, three to five cases at most, we should be able to really uh, learn the technology very, very well. Miroslav, what is your opinion on the learning curve in Bad Kodzinger? Was it fast? Was it difficult? Can you comment on that? Oh, You're yes. still muted. You're still muted, oh, uh, Miroslav. I feel, I feel. Uh, that's a good uh, topic um, because um, so we do a lot of um, rotablation procedures. So I, I do around 150 per year. Um, definitely, uh, it was um, quite quite difficult for me to to go from you know you go with rotational um, rotablation um, with uh, rotablation you go forward backwards forward backwards you achieve much faster um, success compared to orbital so you go with orbital you have to go one millimeter per second so you have to be very slow very patient and this is something what you have to learn um, but learning curve is i would uh, suggest five to ten cases uh, and that uh, will be enough to to perform really in safer way uh, such procedures maybe if there was a very specific very difficult anatomy then you could go uh, with uh, some proctor or whatever you know mm -hmm. these uh, options we have yeah I think that the major part of the learning curve is your mindset because yeah. the manipulations uh, of the device 
that is not that difficult. It's but easy, it's the yeah. mindset. You have to have the discipline to move slowly. And, uh, you know, one millimeter per second, uh, that's that's slow, but it is also very effective. And I think that is the key uh, of this technology. That's correct. And then um, you have to wait around 25, 30 seconds between uh, runs. So this is, uh, I think, also important. But what we saw in Bad Krotzen that usually if we go with rotablation, we, we give... Uh, um, upfront um, atropine, atropine, you know, because of, of bradycardia issues. But um, practically in a ma majority of cases, if we go with orbital atherectomy, we don't have to give atropine or we don't need uh, any pacemaker um, yeah. function. So I think this is a really a benefit also for, for general management yeah. of the patients in the cath lab. And the reason is, of course, that as you are sending or spinning, there is still forward flow, forward blood flow, exactly. right? So there exactly. might be less uh, of a chance or a likelihood of the no reflow phenomenon. Is this also uh, clear from your practice, Dr. Avula, that you don't need uh, atropine or a pacemaker when you do uh, orbital atherectomy lesion preparation? Uh, yes, you know, when I first started many years ago, I think probably the first few cases, I did use sometimes pacemaker there because I was not sure how this is going to react. But this has been many, many years now. And even if patients do get rarely bradycardic, you know, you just wait for maybe two to three seconds, maybe even five seconds, it resolves by itself. I really did not have to give atropine, theophylline or any pacemaker issues at all. Do you, and just then to reflect and to put that into perspective of rotational atherectomy, do you use pacemakers or atropine in that indication? Yes, and if it is a dominant circ or obviously a large dominant right, you know, we do need to do that there because, as you mentioned there, there is no forward flow because the bar is occluding the anti-grade flow there. So for this reason, it's an orbital motion, so the blood flow is continuous. Yeah, you also nicely illustrated with your imaging examples how you affect not only the superficial calcium, but also the deeper calcium in the media. So this sending effect. Basically, what you're doing is you're modifying your, uh, your vessel compliance, right? And in order that you also might increase the stent expansion. Is this something important, do you believe, or uh, is this a trivial finding? I think that is actually the crux of the matter, really, to be honest. Uh, because as I was mentioning in my presentation regarding this Mullins effect, especially with the pulse style forces, because you're bouncing off one wall to the other wall there, that uh, shear stress actually does make, along with the sanding, you got cracks there. Obviously, it makes that the media much more pliable and compliant and expandable there. And I think that really, really does help. Uh, to expand the stents much, much better. Not only debulking the plaque, as we know when we debulk the plaque, you know, it becomes small microparticles like three microns or so. But besides that, I think the bigger picture really is these fractures so that the expansile forces of the balloon and the stent when we're putting the stent in is, is much, more, uh, much more effective for the expansion of the stent. Yeah. Um, uh, Miroslav, what is your practice after you did your uh, orbital atherectomy runs? Uh, you follow it up with a non-compliant balloon or you immediately proceed with stenting? So this is, um, uh, I think, important point. Uh, we don't recommend to go with, um, with stenting as the next step. So we definitely recommend, and this is our standard in our cath lab, we go with non-compliant balloon and check uh, how it looks. Um, uh, uh, do we achieve a really um, balloon? Um, is balloon really nicely open? Or do we have some areas still which is, which could be not perfect. Um, usually uh, we go uh, up to 14, 16, 18 atmospheres. Balloon usually nicely opens. So then there is the question then, do you exchange a Viper wire to some extra support wires using, using um, for example, microcathedral or Sometimes um, the anatomy is easy. You go with a stand. If there is a problem, you can still use uh, as as as, as, uh, as I could uh, do this in few um, cases. Then you could take guideline or Godzilla, whatever you know, to improve support. Mm -hmm. But um, definitely post dilatation, then stent implantation, and again post dilatation. This is um, absolutely obligatory steps. 
So, Dr. Avula, you uh, are using a lot of imaging before and after uh, sanding and spinning. Is that also your practice that you follow that up with a balloon before you stand? Yeah, yes, you know, generally, you know, it is, uh, I mean, as, as time goes by, you will learn how the imaging looks like, and then, you know, you might, you know, but generally speaking, yes, you know, we always predilate after the OAS, you know, before the stenting, so that, as Dr. Maxwell has pointed out, so that we can see the balloon expansion well, and most of the times at 12, 14 atmospheres, we can see it very nicely, and then, you know, uh, in the last so many years, we really did not have any problems with stent expansion. That's the standard protocol, more or less, we follow. Well, and that sums it up. So uh, just to conclude, I think we are very pleased in Europe now to have uh, seen the launch of uh, CSI Diamondback Orbital Atherectomy to treat and uh, modify coronary lesions uh, in Europe now. Uh, the first cases have been very promising. I think the, the number of cases are going up very fast, both in Bad Grozingen in Rotterdam, but also uh, all in multiple centers in Europe. We are learning a lot from our American colleagues, uh, also from their insights from invasive imaging, from orbit and from their eclipse trial. Thank you very much for, uh, for the help, Dr. Avula and Dr. Ferenc. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you very much, EuroPCR, and thank you, CSI, for supporting us. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.